Well, thank you for joining us today. So as we've already been introduced, I've got John here. We're just going to be, I'll get right into it um, in the challenges and opportunities around transatlantic data flows. Um, so to start us off, I would ask you, what do you see as the biggest challenge to transatlantic data flows? Digitalization is happening across all industries. And we're figuring out as a society what the privacy rules we want to live with and how do we, you know, how do we, how do we regulate properly that reflects our social values. Um, in doing so, we need to be able to also recognize we live in a world where digitalization is happening everywhere. Uh, and while individual companies can make a choose a choice whether or not to digitalize, the world economy is, is digitalizing. So we're, we're, in a, we're in a world where we need to evolve our rules and a legal framework, um, and it's going to be an ongoing process. This is not going to be solved this year, next five years, but I think it's going to be an ongoing process as we live in a world where so much of our personal information um, is, becomes part of the digital world. Um, so with that background, you know, right now we've got some small things and some big things. Uh, one of the bigger successes of the discussion on transatlantic privacy uh, has been the Privacy Shield. And it's not perfect, but there was real progress made between the Commission and the Obama administration uh, talking about how do we have privacy protections for Europeans whose data is transferred to the United States. Uh, and now we're coming up on the first annual review of that. Uh, and we've had a change of administration, if people have noticed. And we're not quite sure where all their values are. Um, but we do know that you know, this administration is staying with the Privacy Shield. Um, so it's going to be an interesting process. It does show that the review process is a good thing. Uh, the administration in the US is taking steps essentially to get ready because there's a deadline. Uh, and so they just last week appointed 16 arbitrators who are available to European citizens. Um, they're making appointments to something called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which had been dormant because the Senate Republicans wouldn't advance nominations. Uh, and so I think the privacy shield process is forcing the United States to, to keep moving along and I think, so in the short term, we'll see the Privacy Shield uh, review process this fall. Uh, and I think it's a very good thing. So is, is that the biggest challenge coming up? And are you optimistic about the, the review in a couple of weeks? Uh, look, the Privacy Shield is challenged. There's no doubt about it, right? There, there's, there's cases that have been filed at the General Court in Luxembourg. Um, and there's uncertainty. I can't resolve all those uncertainties, but I can say from a matter of, are we making progress? Are we, are we affecting how American companies treat Europeans' data? Yes. There have been 2,468 entities that have signed up to the Privacy Shield so far. Uh, and it's been in effect for 13 months. Um, now, like our experience at Microsoft is we made changes because of the Privacy Shield. Right? And we set up mechanisms so that Europeans could um, contact uh, us within a legal framework. Um, and you know, those processes um, are working. Okay. And are you worried about the, the court challenges that you mentioned? Or is that just part of the general uncertainty that you have to face every day anyways? Um, I think anybody who reads the decisions coming out of the court uh, across a range of privacy issues, both in Europe and the United States, sees sort of real concern at a sort of uh, at a values level about where we're going with with privacy regulation. Um, and I think it's going to be an evolving process, as I said, that uh, technology is moving. Technology will always be a far ahead of the law. But, so I think there's just, there will be a process of catching up. The United States Supreme Court has made some very uh, pro-privacy decisions 
even though it's a relatively conservative court. And I think you know, we've seen decisions out of the European court um, that are very pro-privacy, uh, frustratingly so to some people. Um, and so I think that there's, there is a level of uncertainty, but we do need, we're gonna need to create mechanisms so that data can move. Are they frustratingly so for you as well? Um, no, I mean, I, you know, I think, um, you know, like on, on passenger, airline passenger names, um, you know, the recent uh, opinions about the Canadian uh, agreement, um, I think, there, you know, there's, there's people involved in, in the security world who are deeply concerned about, well, there's got to be some way for us to be able to address this. And, and so um, that's not a direct concern to us, but that's an example of where um, there's real life concerns by people that, that security is in tension with, with some of these rules. And look, it's not, you know, this is an evolving process. This is going to be one of those top of mind issues for the next 20 years as we, as we develop better rules. And speaking of rules, the US is obviously um, set to decide on the reauthorization of Section 702, which I think will be looked at as part of the Privacy Shield review. What are your expectations for this process? Um, I, th I had hoped that the, the rules might become more privacy friendly. Um, I expect that it won't get worse than it is today. Um, I think the, the Congress is likely just to give a sort of a reauthorization because that's the simplest thing to do. Um, and as a pragmatic point of view, that's something they can, that's the easiest path forward. And you can live with that. Well, I, you know, if I were a member of Congress, I might vote a different way. Uh, but that's. You know. And um, speaking about the Supreme Court, there's also uh, it's also set to decide, I believe, whether to take up um, your search warrant case. The well, here in October, the Department of Justice this summer asked the Supreme Court to review. Um, our legal victory from a year ago, um, where the Court of Appeals held that a search warrant issued by the New York court uh, could not reach an email account that was stored in our Dublin data center. Because the US statute uh, was not, by its terms, extraterritorial, and this would be an unlawful extraterritorial reach of US law. Um, we believe it's the appropriate answer. Um, the Department of Justice has disagreed, um, and I don't think they've got the votes in Congress to overturn it, so they're gonna take a shot at the Supreme Court. We'll see if the Supreme Court takes the case. Again, we'll learn in October. The case, again, it's, it's one of those, it's a piece in the long-term puzzle. We believe we're right, but we also believe there needs to be rules so that law enforcement can get data in appropriate circumstances. In this case, we've said all along, there's a mutual legal assistance treaty between Ireland and the United States. That's the appropriate vehicle by which the US government should obtain the data. Um, there's discussions here in Brussels, and there'll be a proposal, I believe, by the end of the year on electronic evidence. Because, to give an example, um, you know, after the terrorist attacks in Paris, we received an emergency request from the FBI for email data that um, on one of our services. Um, we have legal opinions to kind of guide us on the process for this, and so we, we believe there was a lawful basis to move the data from Ireland back to Seattle, and then we made it available from Seattle to Washington, D.C. to the FBI, and the FBI provided it to the French government of Paris. Now, there needs to be some way for Dublin and Paris to be able to, the national governments within Europe, to work on cross-border data issues without having to kind of um, transfer and go through the United States government. And so the e-evidence proposal, I think, will, will provide a basis for that. It's really important, though, that as they do it, they take into account the privacy interest of European citizens and European organizations. Um, you know, 
governments are moving to cloud computing, and, but governments need to have confidence that their data will not be accessed by another government. Um, and similarly, organizations, media organizations, they want to know that some national government's not going to issue an order that they don't know about to, to try to figure out their sources. Um, and so we need some protections built into this, which is what our primary concern with the e-evidence proposal will be. But generally, it's a very positive step to kind of as we work out what the new legal framework will be as, as we all store more and more of our information um, in the cloud. Because some of the um, proposals being looked at by the Commission, some of the options as part of this e-evidence, the most drastic, which they're quite intrusive, they would basically involve direct access to said evidence, um, which seems to go against much of what has been said before, much of what the previous Commission said in support of Microsoft during the, the search warrant case. Do you, do you see a conflict of sorts? I think it's... They're, they're really good questions to, that are best answered by democratic institutions, right? And, and, I, and I, let me just give you a simple scenario, though, that I think that you'll dis, you, may, you may be more sympathetic with. If there's agreement between countries, and let's assume that there's agreement between Paris and Ireland uh, on this, so there's a basis in international law for it. But, but if a French court issues a search warrant for a French citizen and resident's email account, even though the data is stored in Ireland, it might be easier if, if they can come directly to, to Microsoft or, or whoever the, the email provider is. Uh, and there you can think about, should there be notice to the Irish government things, but, but in the simplest case, um, I think most people would agree that national governments should be able to get data the email accounts through their own legal process um, in, in that, that particular circumstances. So I think in, in some cases it may just be more efficient uh, for the whole system. But that won't solve the problem that we currently have in terms of the transatlantic um, request for data. Right, and the transatlantic issue, um, as I think about it, it's a lot easier to solve if we have an EU solution first because then we can connect the EU solution to the US. Uh, and then perhaps if you can connect Japan, Australia, uh, you've got most of, uh, most of the areas in the world that, uh, that can work together pretty, uh, pretty easily with common values. Um, I certainly encourage the Department of Justice to negotiate with European countries on this. Um, and I kind of got the response that, that's, that's hard to negotiate, especially if Europe doesn't have a common position. And so the U.S. is advancing with a bilateral agreement with the U.K. Um, and I believe that Senator Graham will propose that legislation perhaps even this week. Um, but that, that's at least a start towards building an, an infrastructure, a legal framework recognizing international law that creates the, the basis for governments to access data when they need to. Do you think the, the security, the changed security situation in Europe has changed the balance somewhat away from privacy and towards security in, in the policy making process? I, I think yes. I think um, we get different, it's a different discussion that you get with ministers of interior um, than you get with other parts of government. And we see this, you know, for example, on the privacy directive, you've got two different departments in the German national government which take different points of view. Uh, and, and so you get, you get kind of a stalemate uh, and these things are difficult to resolve. Um, but there's no doubt that there's, there's more concern about how do we protect our citizens. And I, I, I'm, I'm hugely sympathetic. I don't think there's anything more important for government to do than public safety and national security. Um, so what it, what's something that you would not want to see in the upcoming e-evidence proposal? Um, what, 
What I fear most is it would be extraterritorial outside the European Union without agreement. It would just sort of say, you know, we're being sued in Belgium right now um, on a Skype case where Belgium says, we don't care if you have to violate Luxembourg law to be able to get this data because you offer the service in Belgium, um, you need to provide it to us. And, and we could also see Belgium saying, we don't care if, if the data is in the United States or if it's in Japan or wherever it is, you have to provide it. As a principle, you can have that discussion, but you need to operate within the framework of international law, which is that you need agreement before you become extraterritorial on those points. And so my biggest concern is Europe would just try to be a little too muscular and just say, give us our data. So you can find yourself in conflict of law situations within Europe as well? Yes. And that's something that you would, I presume, would want the proposal to address? Yes, and I, and I think that's, look, again, as we, as we evolve and, and, and try to move forward on these things, I personally have been a strong proponent of working out a European Union-wide system because Europe does, the, the, one of the great things about the European Union is accepting the idea of sharing sovereignty in appropriate circumstances and having a good discussion about the best ways to do it. And so I think that within the European Union, we can get to a good solution. So, and I, I also think that we're all better off, you know, it's, it needs to protect privacy interests, uh, needs to, it can't get in the way of, of having data, um, you know, be locked up in a country. Um, just a quick anecdote, we, we met with one of the regional leaders of uh, one of the two regional governments here uh, in Belgium who wanted very much to use a cloud solution. Um, but he said, my advisors tell me I can't do it because even though the primary data center would be right here in my region, the backup would be across the border in the Netherlands. And, and so I can't use a cloud solution because all the data can't be in my section. And the concern there is lawful, you know, that the Dutch government would have access to the regional government's data. And, and we create, it's, it's one of these tail risks. Um, I can't imagine that the Dutch government's really that interested in this data. Um, but, but the fear of it, it does prevent them from acting. And, and taking advantage of the common market of the European Union. Um, you know, we have NATO here in, in Brussels, uh, you know, but for NATO to use a cloud solution, it's gonna be somewhere, and we don't really have a legal framework. And then, you know, sort of like, today they can have armed guards standing at the front of their data center. Uh, in the future, if they move to a cloud center, do we create an embassy for them? I mean, how, how do we make it work? Um, <laughs> You know, but these are real life problems that, that we're gonna work through, um, but I think that's, that's one of the advantages of, of what we can do with, uh, by developing a European e-evidence proposal. I think it would be remiss if I were not to ask about Brexit at least once. Um, do you see Brexit, you mentioned this UK-US deal, but I mean that's not gonna be much help when, once the UK is out. So, do you see Brexit having any impact on transatlantic data flows, or is that just not an issue? Well, I, uh, my concern is that the, the British government has to recognize if they're outside the European Union, they're gonna need to have the same thing like a privacy shield. And, and simply saying, well, we're gonna implement the general data protection regulation, check, we're done, uh, isn't enough. Um, you know, the, the same legal framework that applies to the United States will also apply to the United Kingdom. And I know there's resistance to having kind of the European court evaluate the adequacy of protections under British law um, for surveillance pr uh, purposes. And so I think, you know, but, but wishing it away isn't going to make the problem go away. So you're going to hope that? Yeah, I, I think the UK just needs to, I mean, potentially the problem is if they persist in just sort of hoping they don't have to deal with reality on that point. 
And um, we are running out of time. But finally, one last thing. In these last couple of years, what, what has Microsoft had to change? Have you had to change anything in particular in terms of how you deal with data and how you deal with data flows as a result of the challenges, the invalidation of Safe Harbor and um, the like? We've had a major effort to, for GDPR. We've got 300 engineers working full time for the last year and a half on, on developing our systems, not only for ourselves, but for our customers who run on top of our services so that we can have good compliance with GDPR. Um, so there's a number of changes in how we organize data and, and manage data uh, across our systems. Um, now, if I can just have 20 seconds, I mean, the e-privacy directive, which was mentioned before, adds a whole giant compliance process when we're all struggling right now to, to get ready for GDPR. And I know one speaker this morning said, oh, it just harmonizes rules uh, across the EU28. I disagree very much. Um, what the e-privacy directive does is it extends telecoms rules to every sector of the economy that's using data and moving data. Uh, it's, it's a, it seems to me, a very large regulatory burden without any direct clear benefit. We have run out of time, so thank you very much, John. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs>